Roxo Media House. Today presents our TCU Hall of Fame special, featuring the latest inductees into the TCU Hall of Fame. On today's edition, you'll hear from Andy Dalton. You know, I've just been fortunate to be on some really good teams and be a part of uh, you know some some really good organizations. And Jason Flint. Uh, you're right. He was a, a father figure, always giving us advice, but also giving us a little bit of ribbing uh, that we needed as well back then too. Lee Williams. I was thinking uh, I was thinking about college. I knew I had to grow up some, and I went to junior college for two years. And Brian Holiday. Man, it, it's a it's a coin toss because getting to play in the College World Series is unreal. And now from the TCU Letterman's Hall of Fame, here's your host, the voice of the Horned Frogs. Brian Estridge. Welcome into the TCU Hall of Fame. I'm Brian Estridge, and for the next two weeks, we get the chance to visit with the next eight members of the TCU Hall of Fame. They'll soon find their portraits here on this wall at Showmeyer Arena in Fort Worth, among the elite of TCU athletics. We start our conversation this week with the greatest quarterback of all time, some would say, in Fort Worth. Still owns multiple records, the all-time winningest quarterback and Rose Bowl champion. We begin our show with a conversation with the Red Rifle, Andy Dalton. There had to be a point, Andy Dalton, where you allowed yourself to think, I'm going to be in the Letterman's Hall of Fame at TCU one day. Was there ever that chance? You know, I think for me, I, I thought at some point it might happen, but... Uh, I wasn't sure what all the requirements, how long you had to be out, all that kind of stuff. So uh, when I got the call and found out I was going to be in the Hall of Fame, it was it was really special, a huge honor, and uh, thankful to, that you know I got voted in. It's a, a really cool thing, especially with everything that uh, I was able to accomplish at TCU and and what we were able to do in my time there. Yeah, doesn't this kind of cap it off? Isn't this sort of the, the capstone to that TCU career for you? I think so. You know, I thought the Rose Bowl was going to be the thing that, that capped it off. But, you know, fast forward a couple of years and, and here we are and getting to the Hall of Fame. I mean, I, it, it, my time at TCU was so special. And so I was, you know, thankful for, you know, to, to end it this way with, with getting to the Hall of Fame. And you get to go in with your center and Jake Kirkpatrick. We were joking with him earlier about that's got to be fun for you to have to have Jake alongside. You guys were a terrific tandem uh, for that entire run. And one more time, you get to share the stage together. For sure. Jake's one of my best friends. And so, I mean, there's no other person that I would have liked to share this thing with than, than him getting to go into the Hall of Fame together. You go in, obviously, this year, and it culminates a great career at uh, TCU. When you look back on it, everyone points to the Rose Bowl, obviously. Was there another game, was there another time that stands out as one of your fond memories? Man, I, I get asked this all the time. What was your favorite game in college? Right, what was right. your favorite game that you ever played? Obviously, the Rose Bowl is number one. Hard to beat that one. But I can go back and, and think of several of them. You can go to the our, my junior year in 09 when we played at Clemson. That was a that was one that we went in there into Death Valley and uh, you know found a way to win that one at the end. And 
so that was a cool one. Then the the Utah game that we played at home that year as well. I think that was just the atmosphere that you know that that really kind of set the tone for kind of what what we could be and what TCU football uh, was at, at that time. So you know when everybody rushed the field after the game, that was that was a really cool moment. And so, I mean, I could go back and think of so many different different games, but those are a couple that stand out right away. You know, one of the things that I feel like might be a little underrated for you that we've never had a chance to talk about was you you come out of Katy and you come to TCU, and that first year you played behind Jeff Ballard, and 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 Jeff, who a fellow Houston boy, uh, who who probably would admit if he was sitting right here, hey man, I wasn't the greatest quarterback athletically. But there was a guy that found a way to win every every week. What was he? Nineteen and two as a starter, some record like that. Have we? You and I've never really talked about what playing behind him meant to you. Well, you see a guy exactly what you said. He found a way to win at at, at you know at all times, and so I think that's just kind of you set the standard of okay, you're just going to stay the course of the game. There's a lot that can go on and. Um, so I, I think he was kind of, you know, you know, epitomized that was, it doesn't matter what goes on and maybe the stats aren't exactly what you want them to be. And, you know, I definitely had games that it was the same way, but if you just kind of stay the course of the game and just trust that things are going to get done and, you know, it's going to happen. And I think Jeff was a, a great example of that. And, uh, you know, a lot of people look at, you know, the four years that I was there ending in the Rose Bowl, but, People don't realize that we won 11 games my true freshman year. I think we won it was 11 or 12 games the year before I got there too. So the standard was already kind of set when we got there. And so I think that that goes to show just the program, uh, you know, kind of where it was going and where it was trending when, when I got on the campus in 2006, but also just kind of what the, the standard for the, the type of players and, and, and what we were able to do once we got there. And you go for 50 games as a starter, 42 and eight, still the all-time winningest quarterback, a record that'll be hard to be broken here uh, at, at TCU. Was there ever a point where you were adding those numbers up, where those numbers were in your head? From what standpoint, the number of wins that we were yeah. able to have? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think you know I was fortunate that I was able to start as the freshman. You know, I registered that year and then got to play in 50 games. So. Um, I mean, to, if you're going to be around that long and be able to have be on some good teams like I was able to be on, you know, I think that's one thing that is fun to look back. I, I, I talk about it all the time with guys in the locker room and stuff. You know, yeah, I, I went undefeated in college, you know, but then it was seven and five, <laughs> 11 and two, 12 and one, 13 and oh. So yeah. uh, the progression's there. And uh, it's cool that we got better every year, too. Yeah, 13 and 0, number two ranking after that Rose Bowl as well. But I want to talk about something off the field for just a little bit. And, and that was a ministry that you were a part of that you started. I want to make sure I got it. Was it Ignite? Did I get that right? I'm going back in time here. That's right, yeah. Yeah. So Ignite was a ministry that you and a couple of guys started that I, that I remember running into you one day at, at practice and you said, We had 900 folks Thursday night. And it was like, 900. I mean, talk about the impact that that had as well. And, 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 and as you think back on that, the memories of it. For sure. I, that was something that was cool that I kind of got to be on the uh, beginning stages and, and starting that, that ministry. I think that's one thing we looked at TCU. And at that time, there really wasn't uh, a ministry or a place where students could all go gather. And it basically was a worship service. We had music and then we uh, would ha have a, a, a sermon. And so we thought, you know, this is something that I think TCU was craving. And if we could get something started, uh, then it, it could really take off. And I, I think our first night that we actually had it, it was on the night of the college uh, national championship game, the basketball right. game. And I think we ended up having 600 students there, wow. 600 people. It was like unbelievable just to see how God worked through that whole thing. And, you know, it continued to grow and grow. And so it was something that was cool that, got to be on the ground floor of and, and, and kind of start that and uh, have the foundation with everything and, and got to meet some really good people through. We look back at kind of the crew that started it and like, I don't know how we all got together. God, God obviously ordained that, that group to, 
uh, to help start it. And, I mean, it really took off. Andy, you had a great NFL career that continues now with the New Orleans Saints. You you think about the run in Cincinnati, uh, the fact that you leave there with five straight playoff appearances at one stretch, uh, it, then obviously with the with the uh, with the Cowboys and with and, and with the Bears and and now with the Saints. I mean, this has been one hell of a run that you've been on. Yeah, it's been really cool. You know, I've been fortunate that I've been able to play a lot of football and, and been around for a while. You know, I was talking with somebody the other day. It's like, I'm now the old guy. I'm, you know, I'm the oldest guy on our team here in New Orleans. And so it happens quick. But, you know, I've just been fortunate to be on some really good teams and be a part of, uh, you know, some some really good organizations. And, you know, we're, we're, we're still going. So we'll, we'll see how, how long we we keep this thing going. I say we, obviously. It's a it's more than just me. It includes, you know, my wife, JJ, and then our, our three kids. And so we're still having fun. And I was, like I was saying earlier, we just moved down here to New Orleans. So starting this next chapter in our journey. Will, uh, will your boys play football? Yeah, if they want to. I think they've, they've done flag football. Uh, yeah. At, up to this point and so we'll uh we'll see where their passions lead them and w- what they want to do but uh, right now they're playing every sport that uh that, that they want to play that, that's awesome two quick ones to leave you with two hard ones because you and i've always talked about some of the fun stuff has there been a disappointment or two in your career that stands out to you uh, are you talking TCU career? Are you talking overall, overall things that you say, you know, career. that one, that one still bugs me. Uh, yeah, well, if we're going to talk TCU, the uh, Fiesta Bowl, that's the one that, that, that stands out. You know, we had everything in front of us. We could have had like, two years where we went undefeated. And then I also went on and had Kellen Moore as my offense coordinator that's when right. I was in Dallas. <laughs> too. So luckily I beat him the year before uh, in the poinsettia bowl. But he had it that he he won the Fiesta Bowl. That one was uh, you know a little bit bigger of a game, but uh, yeah, I think that one just because it, w- it would have been nice. I you know the Rose Bowl team was really good. I it was hard to say which team was more talented if it was the Fiesta Bowl team or the Rose Bowl team. And both two really good teams. You know, it would have been nice to end that one. Um, you know there there was a time and then. You know, there's been several things that have gone on, injuries that have happened in my career that, you know, really took a, you know, kind of changed the course and trajectory of what could have happened. 2015 was by far our best season in Cincinnati. Yeah. And, um, you know, got got injured late in the year when we were 12 and 2 and had everything in front of us and wasn't able to play in, in the playoffs that year. And, you know, felt like that we definitely could have made a made a run that year. But I mean, there's also different things that have gone on. So I mean, there's a couple couple things that just initially jumped to mind. You, uh, I, I've known you to be a great student. You're a great dad. You're a great husband. You're a good friend to a, to a lot of us. Uh, obviously, a terrific player. I'm, I'm going to jokingly ask this though: Is there anything that you're bad at? <laughs> Um, that's a good question. Yes, there are things that I'm I'm bad at. If we're gonna talk athletically, I like to think that I'm pretty pretty talented at at most things, right? And which makes it fun because going into the Hall of Fame with Jake, we compete at everything, right? From the moment we stepped on campus, it would whether it be video games, whether it be throwing a football at a stop sign, whether it be you know whatever it is, you know we would always compete and I would say Jake would be one of those guys that's probably not bad at anything. Jake is one of those guys that, that is good at it all. And so, uh, but I like to think that I could compete with him. Andy Dalton, you're the best. Thanks for the time today. Absolutely. How early did we know that Andy Dalton would be a member of this hall of fame one day? You know, his 42 and eight record still stands all time as the all-time winningest in TCU history as a quarterback, but it doesn't compare to the next record. Our next inductee is a gentleman by the name of Jason Flint, who sits at 30 and 0. Remember the faces in the crowd in Sports Illustrated? And there you were for the 30 and 0 mark, right? Our conversation with Jason Flint is next as our TCU Hall of Fame special continues here on Frogs Today.
Say hello to the water of tomorrow. Richard's Rainwater. Richard's Rainwater is 100% rain. Refreshing, renewable, and the only ingredient we use in our water. Why rain? Because everyone deserves access to clean water. And rain is a 100% renewable resource available everywhere. Drink the rain. Save the planet. Shop now at richardsrainwater.com. Welcome back into the TCU Athletics Hall of Fame. Our Hall of Fame special here originating at Schollmeyer Arena on Frogs today. Thanks to our friends of the Block T Association for their hard work in compiling the next eight who will join this Hall of Fame here in Fort Worth. Next up, Jason Flint from Toronto, Ontario. He showed up with an unmatched work ethic that paid off in the pool. Our conversation with Jason Flint right now. Jason, I know you're in Chicago right now, a Toronto native though, and I'd love to hear the story of how somebody from Toronto ends up swimming at TCU. How'd you end up in Fort Worth? Uh, I got really lucky. Um, I was a uh, hockey player, as every Canadian has to do. So I played hockey in the winter, um, and then I swam in the summer. Um, and then I had to, to choose at one point, it was, that was I going to be a hockey player or was I going to be a swimmer? Um, and I had an older brother uh, who was a really good swimmer, and he was already eyeing going down to the States to swim. Um, so he... He actually got a scholarship to George Washington, um, and I wanted to follow my big brother's footsteps. So my parents said, hey, I can, I can look at a school kind of around the Toronto area, like just a couple hundred miles. Um, but I knew there was one school, TCU, that actually recruited uh, some swimmers. And Richard was always walking around the deck at uh, a lot of Canadian swim meets. So I said, OK, I'll, I'll look at some schools around the Toronto area, but there's one school in Texas that I want to apply to. Um, so I, I sent off the letter back then when we were writing off letters uh, to Richard and he replied back. Um, and so next thing you know, that I did a recruiting visit to Texas. I'd never been to Texas um, and obviously fell in love with it. Um, and so that's how I ended up in Fort Worth. Well, Richard Sebasma, of course, a long time. I think it ended up being like 38 years or something like that, the swimming coach here at uh, at TCU. Give us some insight into he, he was more than a swim coach for 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 this team, wasn't he not? I mean, he was he was more of a father figure at times, wasn't he? Yeah. And I mean, I, I would say again, as I, I took my visit to TCU, um, I remember him driving, driving a couple of us around. And he was showing us all the spots. And I was just like, this guy is, he's, he's having fun. And it really looked like a, a great program to be part of. Um, and obviously I think I was lucky enough to go to uh, some mates like NCAAs where it was just Richard and I. And so we, we spent a lot of time together and it was, uh, uh, you're right. He was a, a father figure, always giving us advice, but also giving us a little bit of ribbing uh, that we needed as well back then too. Were, were you riding around in a great, in that great a, were you riding around in the green suburban? Uh, I think that might have been pre-suburban era. Was it pre-suburban era? Because he like had the a, suburban for maybe, about yeah, maybe a maroon. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That, that yeah. is that's how we know Sebas, but that's for sure. You know, you think about it, Jason. <laughs> you look on the you look at this class that you're going into the Letterman's Hall of Fame with, and I'll be honest with you, your numbers shoot to the top, thirty and zero, undefeated. I mean, that's, that's hard to beat, my man. It's never been beat 30 and 0. Give us some insight yeah. into that streak. <laughs> um, well, yeah. So how lucky am I to be uh, inducted into this class? So uh, super privileged to be part of it. Um, so I, again, I, I showed up as a, a freshman at TCU and um, actually had never even swam the event that they swam yards in the U S in, in Toronto and Canada, we swam meters. So I didn't even know the times in and, um, I think it was uh, even sophomore year, Richard's like, hey, wait a minute, you got you haven't lost yet in one of these meets. And so it, it was fun because then every meet we went to, there was just a little bit more pressure because I, I didn't want to give up the streak. So um, I remember just like going into those dual meets, just so focused and excited. And I think I swam on adrenaline a lot because I knew I was like, well, I can't 
I've, I've gone three years or three and a half years now. I can't lose it. I got to give it everything. And um, I think uh, adrenaline powered me through a lot of those races to, to keep the streak alive. The, the thing that stood out to me, and I still remember this, it was uh, March the 8th of 99. Uh, and that was the Sports Illustrated faces in the crowd. Remember the faces yeah. in the crowd in Sports Illustrated? And there you yeah. were for the 30 and 0 mark, right? Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I, I, I remember getting the call. and This is a, an odd story. But again, Sports Illustrated, I remember growing up reading that Faces in the Crowd all the time. It was just a fun page to go to whenever we got the, uh, uh, the weekly magazine. Um, and to get the call that I was going to be on that was, was mind-blowing. But the problem was swimmers were kind of a weird batch. I think I had just died. I had a little more hair back then. And I dyed it like a white color. And I'm like, oh, no, I can't go into my one uh, shot with my, my uh, sports illustrator with white hair. So I went down to the Albertsons there and we tried to recolor it. And I think it ended up green and it was fried. Um, so I'm, it's kind of funny that my sports illustrated is this uh, attempted hair job that I did. But uh, super fun to be in sports illustrated that uh, what, a, uh, what a treat that was. Three-time academic All-American. Give us some insight in uh, how you took your time academically here at TCU and what you're doing with it now, career-wise. Yeah, I mean, I I uh, I went in and it was I really enjoyed going to schools and it was interesting. I, I came in as a a biology major. I thought I was going to go pre-med. Um, ended up taking some some marketing classes, business school, and I think maybe that was part of the uh, athlete in me. I just loved competing. And in my mind, marketing was all about competing, winning. How do you win, like win the customers? So I think um, I chose uh, that track and really enjoyed it. Um, and so this day, still in kind of that space, um, I'm in technology for United Airlines. Um, and so working on the mobile app and the website. And so uh, always trying to win, win the next customer um, like the past. I, l- I love it. Are you still doing the 10,000 yard workouts four times a week? I can't. I'm sorry. I, every now and then I look at uh, the pool and be like, man, that looks fun. I want to get back in there. Um, but uh, it, it was a, it was a tough sport that, as you said, 10,000 uh, yards and, and hours. Um, so I'm doing a, a couple different sports now in Chicago. We do uh, paddle tennis when it's negative, yeah. you know, uh, zero degrees yes. outside. Pickleball. And yeah. 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 So having, having, having some fun with some new sports. I love it. Jason, congratulations on the honor, man. Thank you for taking the time to visit with us. We look forward to seeing you back here in September. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to it. A 30 and 0 record for Jason Flint that will stand the test of time here in Fort Worth. Up next, he is a legend here in Cowtown. He was a terrific runner at Poly, came to TCU, was first class all the way as a sprinter here. And now, as a coach, continues to touch lives to this day. He's also now a member of the TCU Hall of Fame. If you would, please welcome Lee Williams. Lee Williams is a guy that if you look back in the annals of TCU track history, you talk about a foundation builder. Uh, Lee is that. Coach, good to see you, man. Thanks for coming on here with me. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Let's start with the Hall of Fame. Uh, the Letterman's Hall of Fame. When you got that phone call, what'd you think? Uh, I was excited. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I really was. It was appreciation. And uh, since I'm a hometown boy, that meant a lot to me. Did you think, was there ever a point where you thought to yourself, ah, they're not going to put me in. It's it's passed me by. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, but it was okay. I was yeah. enjoying what I was doing and still getting recognition for the city of Fort Worth and right. the school district with what I was doing as a coach, and I was good with that. Yeah, so um, was it a total surprise when you got the phone call, or had somebody kind of given you a heads up? Uh, Somebody kind of gave me a heads up, one of my track boys. Yeah. uh Uh-huh, that ran for TCU. Right. Johnny Collins. Yes, the great Johnny Collins. Uh, Johnny said, hey, coaches, they might be calling. Yeah. That's what a good feeling. You think about, when we talk about foundation builders, you think about your history here. Uh, and, and the fact that your your team was the first one to qualify for the NCAA tournament, right, as far as re- yes. relays is concerned. Yes. First one to qualify for the NCAA meet. I mean, that says a little something right there, doesn't it? 
Oh, yes. We're very proud of it. Me, yeah. David Harden, Gary Peacock. David Harden. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, Samuel McKinney. Right. Uh, we qualified in the mile relay in 73, and we qualified in the 4 by one in 74. Wow. You, you mentioned you were a hometown boy. You went to Poly. Yes. Ran, ran at Polytechnic for, uh, for my, our man Paul Galvan. Yes. Coach Galvan. So you guys were really good back then, weren't you? Yes, we were pretty good. Yeah. And so um, did you think you would end up at TCU, or were you even thinking about college at the time? Uh, I, was thinking, uh, I was thinking about college. I knew I had to grow up some, and I went to junior college for two years at Ranger Junior College. Yeah. That place will make you grow up. <laughs> and uh, then my teammate, Gary Peacock, was from Poly, too, so – I wanted to run with him, so I came back to Fort Worth. Yeah. TCU. And have been a legend since. Obviously, you ran at TCU, had a great career that put you in the Hall of Fame. Then you decided you were going to become an educator and a teacher and a, and a coach. Yes. What led to that decision for you? Uh, I always wanted to be a coach. I uh, really didn't even know what a coach was. I uh, started in the seventh grade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to do that. And from there, I just bloomed out and I was able uh, to get a job here in Fort Worth and that was a proud moment for me. Yeah. Uh, and dedicate myself to working with the kids and letting them know what else was out there in the world besides uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Yeah, and I tell you, one, the one thing that you've done is you have, you've had an impact on a bunch of lives. Uh, your career that spans all those years and, I, and, and the impact that you had at O.D. White especially. And you guys, over the years, you, you put some heck of, a heck of a team out there. Oh, yeah. Uh, me learning the kids, kids learning me, and uh, learning how to take things seriously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You had a state championship at one point, right, in the 2000 relay? Uh, Didn't that team win a state championship for you? 98, we won it. 90, 98, you won the 400 meters, right? Uh-huh. We that won the, the state championship that year. Yeah. Was that the, third, was that the national record? Uh, in the 400 meters, yes. your team? Yes. They is that still hold it. Is that still around? Yes. Wow. It's been uh, 539s run. Really? Uh-huh. And yours was 39.76, right? Yes. And you add the other four, we got five of the top ten yeah. in there because we ran, that special group ran 39-something. Yeah. Five different times. Wow. Think about that, man. That is flying. Yes, it that is. is. That, that is awesome. And that's something that still stands today. That's what's that's what's great. But they and I've read a couple of quotes from guys that were on that team who said they actually thought they were faster than that. That they were faster than the three nine seven six. The thirty nine seven six. I thought that too, but uh back then it was a blind draw. Right. And we wind up with lane one. And lane one and lane eight are probably the two hardest lanes to run out of. And for them to run a national record out of lane one was just fantastic. Do you uh, do you still own some TCU records? Because at one point you had a couple of them, right? Uh, yeah, the mile relay. The mile relay uh, and the 400? The 400 meter relay. Yeah. Well, it was yards then. Right. And uh, I uh, set the record in the 400, uh, 400 dash. Yeah. But uh, our lows are broken. Yeah. Uh -huh. But think about that, though. You, those were yours, man. Those were oh, yours yeah. at one point. Oh, that's, yeah. That's, you appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. As you, uh, I think you appreciate it more as you get older. Yeah. And uh, realize that you were doing some things that nobody else had done at TCU. Right. Well, when you look at your resume, and it's it's pretty impressive of all the uh, players that you've coached over the years, yeah. all the success that they've had, the Coach of the Year awards that you've been a part of. You know, you've champion, been state champions a couple of different times. Yes. What, what sticks out to you the most as as the your most favorite accolade? What, what's, the, what's the one thing that sticks out to you the most? Uh, from a standpoint of coaching, uh, being named Coach of the Year for the state of Texas. That's your peers saying that, right? Yes. That, tell, that says uh -huh. a little something. And that happened twice. So very appreciative of that. Yeah. And, of course, winning the state championship in 98. Yeah. And she is holding two national records, for one of them for 20 years and the other for 24 because we ran the 4x200 uh, in Florida 
and uh, won by three seconds yeah. with nobody pushing. Really? Uh-huh. And uh, I know the team that broke our record, they had people pushing them. I told them that's the difference. Uh, you have to have somebody make you run to run fast. Yeah. And by us running by ourselves, that wouldn't happen. I run a lot faster when somebody's chasing me. I do too. <laughs> hey, I want to leave with this. One of the things that you were known for that you did is you warmed up your teams outside of the stadium. You never, you, you didn't like to warm them up very much in, in the in the event field. Why is that? Just too much distraction, especially when I had a good team and you have the fans being fans yelling and hollering at them and yeah. breaking their focus. So I decided uh, in 98 that I was not going to have those kids where the public could just holler and scream at them all the time. And at the state meet, I brought in one of my former athletes that's a DEA agent. Yeah. And he was down there keeping people away from them. Really? Yes. Because everybody knew who they were. Yes, we had already... Uh, broke the national record in the prelims at the regional meet. Yeah. And then we came back at state meeting, of course, broke that record. And uh, I just needed people to stay away from them until they, I didn't even want the parents around. <laughs> I just, as soon as they get through competing, you're more than welcome to talk to them. So they walked out there confident and blew the doors off. Yes. And I was up there sweating and everything else. And once I saw them walk out there on the track and they act like they were the only ones on the track, I knew they were ready to compete. Lee Williams has been a heck of a career. Yes, it has. Congratulations on headed off into the Letterman's Hall of Fame. Thank you. I got. Uh, I just remembered I got to uh, uh, make a phone call when I leave here because they want to take a group pitch out of the Hall of Famers next yeah. week. You got to get it going then. Oh, I'm all right. Thank you now. Uh -huh. I really appreciate okay. it. Lee Williams joining us here, uh, here on Frogs today. We got a lot more still to come after this timeout. The Flying Tea Club provides the everyday TCU fan and alum the ability to specifically support TCU student athletes. Flying Tea Club offers three levels of memberships. The Flying Tea Club is a nonprofit organization supporting the brand development of TCU student athletes through a series of unique event based networking opportunities, which are exclusive to our members. These events provide a great social engagement tool for our members and student athletes alike. Follow them on Instagram at Flying Tea Club or online at flyingteaclub.com. Welcome back into our TCU Hall of Fame special here at the Hall of Fame at Schollmeyer Arena. Thanks to our friends of the Block Tea Association. Here at Frogs today, we thought we would visit with all eight of the newcomers into the Hall of Fame. We've worked our way through three. Our next guest can simply be described as tougher than nails. His name, Brian Holiday, the frog catcher, and he joins us right now. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Man, congratulations. You get the phone call that says you're going in the TCU Letterman's Hall of Fame. What'd that feel like? Man, it, it's honestly a dream come true. It's, uh, words can't describe how, how proud it makes me and, and how humble it makes me feel. Uh, it's just absolutely incredible. You know what I would think, and this will never happen to me because I'll never be in a Hall of Fame, but if I were you and I got the Johnny Bench Award like you did, or if I was, you know, the on that all-tournament team for the College World Series. In the back of my mind, I would have said, I'm going to get in the TCU Hall of Fame. Did you, did, has it ever <laughs> crossed your mind? It, it really it really never crossed my mind uh, until I got the phone call. I, I, I never thought about it. it uh, like it, Yeah, it just never crossed my mind. Uh, and then I got that call, and it was just ecstatic. You know, I got to call my family and tell them, and, and it's just a really special feeling. You think about where this baseball program is now, Brian and the experience that they've had over the last 12, 15 years. I mean, you're, you're the building block to that. I mean, you, you're, you're right there, man. That, that you're, you're one of the, the key. Take you away, and it's like Jenga, and it just comes I don't know if I'd, I don't know if I'd go that no, far. No, I mean, you, you, I, 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 I'm not saying you're <laughs> the only one, but Jake Arrieta is going into the Hall of Fame. Another guy like that. You know, yeah. take Jake Arrieta away, who, who knows? Yeah, you know, you I mean, take you away, who, no, who knows? It's a it's a credit to TCU and and the people they brought in and how well how well we work together. Um, all those guys, the guys before me and the guys after me, that were able to continue it. You know, it's uh, the continuity of the program has been unbelievable, and that's a that's a credit to TCU as a whole, the coaching staffs. Uh, they've just done a tremendous job of bringing the right guys in. You know, when you think about it, too, you were a three-time All Mountain West Conference player, and 
God love the Mountain West Conference, but back then the Mountain West Conference was pretty dang good. It was. You think about the guys that were coming through, and and I, I you know, you you looked across the du- the way, and there's Tony Gwynn in the dugout. You know, I mean, that was a good league back then. It was, it was. We had we had some tough guys. I mean, you bring up Tony Gwynn. We had to face Steven Strasburg yes. regularly, and that was a, that was a challenge in itself. Yeah, that was fun times, though, man. And you you think about then from TCU, drafted by the Tigers, show up there and, and give us some sense of what that was like for you, and because you quickly ascended to the bigs, that, did that happen quicker than you thought it would? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It was a it was a whirlwind, you know, um, playing in the College World Series. I had about a, a week off before I had to report to uh, minor leagues with the Tigers. And, you know, I went in there, and my, my first roommate was a guy at Cal State Fullerton that, that I, we played against yes. and had some pretty good battles against. So we had some good stories to tell. And then the same draft class, Chance Ruffin from UT, yep. that I hit, hit a couple homers off of. He shows <laughs> up there. Um, but it was great being around those guys. And then, like I said, it was a whirlwind. We, I think I had 45 games in that high A season. Um, and then I went straight to the instructional league and then double A for a full year. And then I started in triple A for a month and got called up. Yeah. So it was, it happened fast. Pretty amazing. You there were only like three guys and that got caught up that quick, I think. Right. From that 2010 class. So you spent a good, what, six years, five or six years in the Tigers organization. Yep. Yep. And then, and then you end up with the Rangers and I'll be honest with you, Brian. I thought when you signed with the Rangers, I thought it's going to be a long run. This is – did you feel the same way? Did you feel like, hey, I'm coming home, I'm going to be here a while? Without a doubt. That's uh, – I mean, that's what what you – I mean, you can't hope for a better better scenario than that, coming home and getting to play for your hometown team, the team you grew up watching. Uh, and just that in itself, just getting to play one day for your hometown team is incredible. And that was just such a such a great time. Yeah, but it wasn't to be. I mean, it, it wasn't to be a long run. When they signed Luke Roy and then you're out, did you did you were you starting to second guess things at that point at all or no? No, not really. Um, I think just kind of my mentality is just to to persevere above all and and to just grind it out. And so I never I never gave up on myself and never never let any doubt creep in as as uh, easy as it is to to do. Um, you know, I I tried to push through. I, I want, I've got the list here because I want to make sure I get it right. Boston, Philly, Detroit. Marlins, Orioles, Arizona. You wanted a little bit of a tour. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Tell me what that was like. And, 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 and was that mentally challenging, not knowing where the next stop was or how long it oh, would be there? Ab- absolutely. It was, yeah. uh, it was definitely mentally challenging, uh, you know, never knowing what, what the next day would bring. Um, you know, it's tough when you go at, at the end of every season, you're essentially a free agent again. Yeah. And, having to work work at it all over again and trying to develop new relationships and you know trying to trying to fight for a job with a new team every single year it's uh, it's not easy to do and so it's definitely a grind but uh, it was something that that I'll definitely cherish we got a lot of swag out of it right <laughs> absolutely if, if nothing else <laughs> did you have a favorite was there a favorite in that group where you thought you know what I, I love this organization I could be here I would say Detroit will always have a, a special place in my heart. Yeah. They were the teams that drafted me. They're, I made my debut with them. You had some uh, great pitchers when you were there, yeah, man. We had some great teams, great yeah. pitchers. Uh, so that was always incredible. Outside of that, I would say Boston. Getting to play in Fenway Park, getting to play Sunday night baseball against the Yankees, that's, I mean, it's legendary stuff. And, and that's just absolutely something that I would cherish and, and say that would be my favorite stop. You know, compare all of that. Compared to the being able to play, as you said, to be able to play in the in uh, for Boston and in Fenway and all the great facilities that you were in, compare all that to the College World Series. How, how does it compare? I mean it it's a it's a coin toss because getting to play in the College World Series is unreal and and it's uh, just such a great atmosphere on the field, off the field. The whole city of Omaha takes you in and treats you right. And, I mean, you're playing in front of 25,000-plus every night. And, I mean, words can't describe how great of a feeling that is. So, of all the big league ball that I played, I mean, the College World Series is right up there with it, if not topping it. I'm going to go back a little further. You were 11 or 12. It was a sunny day. 
you were playing third base. Your first baseman had glasses on. <laughs> you hummed one from third to first. First baseman staring right in the sun. What happened? Well, to, to say he completely whiffed it would be a lie. I think it tipped off the top of his glove. Right. And it hit him right between the eyes. Right. And he had the wireframe glasses on. Right. And, I mean, it, it looked like his face just exploded. He just, I mean, from eyebrow to eyebrow, just cut straight across. Yeah. And he's laying on the field bleeding. And I, 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 thought, I, I thought I killed him for yeah. a second. <laughs> I, I, heard, I heard you called the next day yeah. just to check on him. I think I was more upset than he was about yeah. it. Folks, we're talking about our own Jamie Plunkett <laughs> here from Frogs today. Where they were, they, these guys went to WTY together, but he hummed one and hit him yep. right in the head, <laughs> and he had to have stitches right yep. o- over it. Man, congratulations on being in the Hall of Fame. Hey, Thank we kind of consider you part of the Frogs Today family. You've been in the Lizard Lounge before, and we want to get you back in there again. I love, and, I love being here. So yeah. anytime, anytime I can be here, I'm, the, I'm available. Let me, let me ask you this. Let me close with this. How, how did you know when it was time to hang them up? Um. You know, it was honestly it's just something in my heart. Like I, I really felt like I couldn't give a hundred percent anymore, and I, I knew that it's not fair to myself or my family to try to grind it out if I can't be a one hundred percent there, one hundred percent available and committed to, to doing all the things that are required to being a baseball player. That it's not fair to ask my wife and kids to travel it's not fair to make them make sacrifices for me if i can't be 100 percent committed well i can tell you that uh if anyone watched you play and especially watched you play at lupton they knew that you gave it 100 percent every game absolutely one of my favorites thanks for coming by man thanks for having me all right brian holiday terrific career in the bigs amazing career here at tcu and now a hall of fame member for the horned frogs what a day Andy Dalton, Jason Flint, Lee Williams, Brian Holiday. That's four down. Four more to come next week on episode two of our Hall of Fame special here for Frogs Today. But don't go anywhere. There's news of the week that we've got to get to. We do it with our roundtable of experts, Jeff Wilson and David Bowden. They join us next here as Frogs Today continues in a moment. The Flying Tee Club provides the everyday TCU fan and alum the ability to specifically support TCU student-athletes. Flying Tee Club offers three levels of memberships. The Flying Tee Club is a nonprofit organization supporting the brand development of TCU student-athletes through a series of unique event-based networking opportunities, which are exclusive to our members. These events provide a great social engagement tool for our members and student-athletes alike. Follow them on Instagram at Flying Tee Club or online at flyingteaclub.com. Back at Showmeyer Arena, we come here for Frogs today, our Hall of Fame special this week, but there's news of the week that we need to get to as well. We brought in Jeff Wilson and David Bowden earlier, our round table of experts to talk about our news headlines that we're faced with. We started the conversation with the MLB draft, where the Frogs were represented quite well. Here's Jeff Wilson with some insight. You know, nobody got selected on day one where, where all the big money is, but but day two, Raleigh Cornelio and, uh, um, excuse me, Bolden got, got drafted by the Nationals and the Red Sox. And then uh, just just in, in day three, early on, uh, Marcelo Perez to the Mariners and uh, Austin Krobe to the Padres. So, you know, I, I think the expectation is that they, they may all go. Um, I think that's why, why uh, they've been pretty... The Kurt Sar- Sarlos has been pretty uh, active in, in getting pitchers in the transfer portal. So, uh, you know, you got to prepare for these kind of things. But just because they're drafted does not mean that they have to go. Now, the guys who are out of eligibility, obviously, are going to go. They don't have much leverage. They'll ch- sign for cheap. Cornelio is the one who could probably get get a get a pretty good deal. And, and Krobe, Krobe also has a year of eligibility remaining. Yeah, and by the way, testament to the program, too, to have that many going. Right? Sure, for sure. You know, I mean, it's... You know, and this was thought to be a maybe a, a little bit of a down year at, at TCU, at least as far as MLB talent. But um, look, you get these guys in a system, and you never know what they're going to do. Yeah, I'm going to hit you back on the Rangers in a second. First, right. so uh, David Bowden, let's talk quarterback situation at TCU. A lot was made of Sonny Dykes' comments at Big 12 Media Day. I'm trying not to read too much into that just yet. What do you, what do you get? Yeah, I, I'll be honest. I, I might have been the only one there that thought it was it was pretty authentic, right? It, he was he, you know. 
Uh, I know I read Melissa's piece, and, and she sort of read between the lines on where the quarterback situation was going, maybe uh, you know, leaning towards Morris a little bit. Um, I, I think he was spot on. It's something that it, it's hard to articulate because he, he said, look, you can't put your finger on it, but something just happens during camp, right? Guy may have a great spring. Someone else may have a really good summer. And then something just kind of takes over um, you know, during camp. And I think he's right. You, you know, just kind of whether it's a leadership thing, a lot of times you know, these decisions aren't made on – I mean, they all have armed talent and all right. those things, right? It's who can run the show? Who yeah. can I hand the keys to uh, to lead this thing and make sure that we're as, as efficient as possible? Um, so I, I found that, you know, really interesting and, and really genuine. I think the other thing is uh, he had mentioned um, – you know, just kind of that he'd be the last one to know, yeah, right? Yeah. And and that's also, uh, he's, he's spot on. Because as a head coach, he's worried about, hey, is this going to offend this coach? Or I'm recruiting this guy's cousin, so I have to make sure. And, and meanwhile, everyone else is watching and saying, hey, coach, he's doing the best job, yeah. right? This is make it easy on you. So uh, I thought he was like, pretty revealing, and, and, and it was telling um, that he, he truly doesn't know at this point. You know, the thing you talk about is the it factor. You know, when that it factor arises, right. that ought to, Jeff, that ought to be your next book if you can ever define what the it factor <laughs> is. You know, it's one of those things where I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Right. Right. But w- that that's what it takes to be a quarterback, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, and a lot of coaches, a lot of successful, you know, really great coaches yeah. have been duped, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Because they see a guy in shorts in the offseason sure. and it's got the tightest spiral and he oh, throws yeah. the prettiest ball. Well, I mean, obviously, we all know it's a lot different when you got you know defensive end, you know, trying to take your head off. Now, the thing is, it's hard to replicate that in practice, obviously, right. at quarterback, and so you just don't know until you've got some live bullets flying, and uh, that's the that's the hard part about you know getting uh, making a quarterback selection. But that's why he's in the job he is and making the money he is. I remember when you used to brag on Dieter Brock and how he could throw it, but I mean, you know, <laughs> right. he had to fight the way to the CFL. You know, <laughs> come on, he could throw it, but that was about it. All right, uh, realignment, real quick. I want to hit both of you guys on this. D- uh, Dennis Todd wrote a piece this week uh, talking about the potential of uh, the Notre Dame and the NBC Sports and bringing the Big Twelve as shoulder programming with that deal. They're Notre Dame looking for $75 million. There's been an, an, another rumor that came out that the Pac-12, the Big 12, that those negotiations have, have broken down. Jeff, let's start with you. What do you think? Well, it, it, it's eerily quiet. I, you know, I think the, an, the anticipation was when USC and UCLA went to the Big Ten that things would happen like that week. Yeah. And, and that just hasn't been the case. Now, we, we don't know what's going on behind closed doors, as was the case with uh, the Big Ten and, and the two Pac-12 schools. Um, you know, the the one thing that Brett Yormark Mark said, you know, well, we're open for business, right? And but he he said we're going to do whatever is best for the conference, and and we want options, and you know, it, it wouldn't be bad to tire, tire, you know, hit your horse to, to Notre Dame, and yeah. uh, you know, NBC. Uh, while, while a lot of people don't think of it as a college football destination, you know, hey, if you're the only show going, then then maybe they would, but. You know, I just think there are a lot of opportunities for TCU. I really do. Why do I struggle with the phrase shoulder programming? You know, I, I know what they're saying, that they need additional hours. But to me, that almost sounds like your, you know, your second thought there. Yeah. You know, with Notre Dame. Sure, yeah, well, I, I think that they're also, the way they're thinking may be a little antiquated as well, right? Yeah. I mean, with the rise of the SEC and the Big Ten, the way this is going, right. um, I, I think they have to be, all this posturing, they have to be careful, right? Yeah. It, this isn't, we're not talking about, you know, Notre Dame of, of old here. Um, quality program, obviously, you know, been into the national playoffs, all of that stuff. Right. Um, but I don't know if they have the same clout as maybe they feel. Now, th- obviously they do because they asked for $75 million, <laughs> right? right? right, right. Uh, so I, I think that's it. And I think in terms of the, the Pac-12 and in, in the, in the Big 12, it's sort of a game of chicken right now. You yeah. know, and I thought, you know, same to you. I thought everything was going to happen fast. Yeah. And they're just kind of bracing themselves saying, hey, who's going to blink first? $20 billion endowment at Notre Dame. You'd think they could uh, paint the end zones. Right. You know? I mean, come on. All right, uh, real quick. Uh, Rangers today, this week. Uh, you, I, I'm sure it's draft heavy. What are you going to be talking about? Lots of lots of draft. The Rangers the Rangers just really pulled a couple fast ones that, yeah. that really shook up the draft. and uh, Could be great. Could be. I mean, if Kumar Rocker yeah. and Jack Leiter, they've obviously pitched together and were great at Vanderbilt. And if, if Rocker is healthy... Uh, and then the, the fourth round pick, a, a kid named Brock Porter, who Michigan prep threw three no hitters this year. Yeah. Gatorade National Player of the Year, and he fell out of the top the, the top ten and all the way to the fourth round. Yeah. The Rangers how, snagged how does him. that happen? 
you know, they, he had a, he has committed to, to Clemson, right? Uh, and and I think he he probably you know, his agent is Scott Boris, <laughs> and so our advisor, right? And so he probably put out, hey, if you want if you want to sign him, you got to give him first round money. Yeah. And the Rangers, because of the way they structured the Rocker deal, are able to do that. All right, David Bowden uh, dissecting the frogs this week. I know you got a couple of things on social media where you're looking at the 22 new. The new guys coming into the TC, right? Yes, yeah. I just want to give the fans an opportunity to to get you know uh, familiar with the new newcomers, right. uh, both transfers and and uh, uh, freshmen. So Jordan Hudson's the first one, a kid right down the road in Garland, and yeah. uh, excited to, to do that. So it, it, it's coming soon. All right, thank you, man. Thanks for stopping by. It's about our Hall of Fame edition here of Frogs today, episode one. Back again next week with another edition with four more candidates uh, headed off to the uh, Letterman's Hall of Fame at TCU. Don't forget, if you'd love to advertise with us, we'd love to have you. Uh, all you got to do is uh, follow that uh, email on the bottom of your screen. Make sure you subscribe at frogstoday.com and on our YouTube site as well. Become part of the family here at Frogs Today. Till next week with another edition of our Letterman's Hall of Fame special. I'm Brian Eskin. Have yourself a great day. Frogs Today is brought to you by the Flying Tea Club, supporting TCU student-athletes, and by Richard's Rainwater. Say hello to the water of tomorrow. Frogs Today is a production of Roxo Media House. Media House.